So recently, I rewatched Hunter x Hunter 2011. You know, as you do, one of the best animes ever made. This time, however, I decided I'd watch the whole series in order whilst trying to find a time to watch the two movies. Madhouse, a long production for Hunter x Hunter 2011, developed two movies for the series. Primarily, it would seem, to cash in. And hey, that, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with cash grabs, support me on Patreon. The films, however, are pretty awful. The first film is called Hunter x Hunter Phantom Rouge, whilst the second film is called Hunter x Hunter The Last Mission, and both of them fit in, allegedly, in between the events of the anime, with Phantom Rouge happening right before the ending of the York New City arc, and with The Last Mission taking place just after the beginning of the Chimera Ant arc. With the same animation team behind them, these films aren't directed by Hiroshi Kojina, but by Yuzo Sato and Keicho Wakaguchi, respectively. So already, I can kind of presume that these films were released in between the main series, whilst the main team kept working to get some extra cash flowing in. But anyway, let's start off with Hunter x Hunter Phantom Rouge. This movie starts off with a canon beginning, believe it or not. In the middle of the once largest hiatus in Hunter x Hunter, Togashi made a two chapter backstory for Kurapika, which tied into the film. And because it's written by Togashi, it's canon. Even if it is just 20 minutes, this is one of the best things you can watch if you miss the anime and you need something else to fill in that hole. <laughs> the rest of the movie, however, well, it starts with Gon and Killer were meeting up with Leo Ryo and Kurapika, the latter of which has had his eyes stolen from Pyro a young friend from the Kurta clan. Whilst blind, Kurapika sees a vision of Pyro and the fourth member of the Phantom Troop, the member that Hisoka has already replaced. To try and track the fourth member and Pyro, the Quadrio search the Hunter Association's website. They manage to narrow down Kurapika's vision to the Totoria district, so off Gon and Killer would go to discover the mystery, whilst Leo Rio stays behind to look after Kurapika. They stop at a nearby village that fits the bill when they find a puppeteer called Rets. Killer doesn't get along with Rets because of Illumi's needle, something that he'd need to discover later on in the Chimera Antarg. But yeah, that's something that is going to be coming up a lot in this film. That night, Gon and Killer are attacked by Uvergen. They're confused because <laughs> he's dead. They're overpowered by Uvergin, but Nobunaga, the real one that is, comes to defeat him himself. More clones come, and so the rest of the spider reveal themselves, informing Gon and Killua of Omokage, a man who can create Nen puppets from people that retain the powers and abilities of the subject in question. He can also do this with corpses, as that's apparently what happened with Pyro. So basically, they part ways, and Gon and Killua temporarily part ways with rats when they run into a puppet of Illumi which does much of the manipulation that we come to see again later in the series. The puppet manages to take Gon's eyes, and Killua freaks out over Illumi's prophesizing and runs away, almost taking his own life until Gon arrives. And it's a bit of a bad habit with these movies. Instead of trying to make something that actually stands by itself or tells its own story, they choose to take place before the events of later in the story, but cover those story elements anyway, just half as well. Gon manages to stop Killua just as Lirio and Kurapika arrive. The four friends finally reunite and get ready to storm the mansion to defeat Omokage. It's revealed that Retz is the youngest sister to Omokage the whole time, and she's dead. This is just her puppet. So the Quadrio enter the mansion and find that Pyro now has Kurapika's eyes and Illumi is still there. They fight their respective enemies, get over their own troubles with the POWER OF FRIENDSHIP, and witness Omokage release all of the puppet spiders. Hisuka joins the fight and manages to take down Karolo and a bunch of others, whilst Gon and Killua distract Omokage so that Chain Jail can be used. It works, and Kurapika is about to kill Omokage when Retz surprises everyone and finishes the job, saying that this is what she would have done if she was still alive anyway. The real Phantom Troop arrive to kill their puppets, they then divert their attention to Kurapika, but they can't do anything because of the chain around Karolo's heart, so they just leave. When the group turn around, Retz and Omokage are on fire, and they die. The four talk about what they'll do next, which is, yep, doctor, eyes, dad, babysitting, the usual, and that's it. A beautiful credit song plays, and I can't believe it was produced for this film, and never used ever again. In terms of plot holes, this story simply doesn't fall into the timeline of the anime at all. In fact, it doesn't even try. But it'll happily use all of its story beats prematurely. The idea of Omokage's power is stupidly OP. That he can copy people, and those copies can use all of the powers owned by the puppet moniker? That's too much. The fact that Hisuka kept him alive to get stronger is a load of bogus. Because how is he ever going to get stronger? 
all it can increase is the amount of puppets he creates, so it's nonsense. To go a step further, Kurapika uses Chain Jail against the old Phantom Troop member, and the guy just shrugs it right off. First of all, it's supposed to be unavoidably quick, and undeflectable in its strength. The only hope that the troop have against it is staying out of range or dodging quick enough. The chain itself bouncing off the way it does is such a mistake. Secondly, this isn't a member of the Phantom Troop, and Kurapika even acknowledges this, justifying the role in the Kurta Massacre and the tattoo as enough for him to consider Omokage a spider. So the movie thinks that at the end of the day, it's whoever Kurapika thinks is a spider that he can use chain jail on, and that's both awfully convenient and complete hypocrisy. Whilst they get a lot of the characterization right in Phantom Rouge, it's so weirdly offbeat for Kurapika to be so accepting of his friend's help, considering how much Kurapika started his mission of revenge by himself and continues in the story to isolate himself off with them. For Phantom Rouge to happen, Kurapika has to be weirdly okay with all of this, and it just doesn't really work. But hey, to give some positives, I will concede that the few new soundtracks added to the list are amazing, and really match with Kurapika's clan, but that's it. This movie is a strange one. I'd give it a 4 out of 10. And so that means we're on to Hunter x Hunter, The Last Mission. This movie has such a strangely great beginning that it's really upsetting that they chose to take it down the same old road that every other anime film always does. The film starts out with Gon and Killua, I assume taking a pit stop whilst on the way to East Goto in Kite's Blimp. Gon and Killua are here to watch Heaven's Arena's Battle Olympia. And aside from a prequel, the Battle Olympia has to be the most perfect idea for a Hunter x Hunter film. And it's done surprisingly well. We see Zushi has gained skill, muscle, and flaws all the way to compete here. Chairman Netero gives a speech, and the Floor Masters, including the Upper Floor Champions, are all introduced. They warm up, Bisky, Wing, Hisoka, and Kurapika are all there getting ready for the beginning, and Leo Rio is on the way. Could you imagine if things got better from here? If they actually fleshed out the contestants with their own unique abilities and pitted them against one another? If Zushi had developed his own Hatsu, and if there was some kind of mad reward for winning Battle Olympia? Wouldn't that be a good movie? It wouldn't even need to fit in with the manga or anime, considering Phantom Rouge clearly set a disregarding precedent. It'd be so cool if they just went f**k it and made a whole fully fleshed out Battle Olympia. Well, too bad, because a ragtag group of stereotypical anime bad guys arrive and interrupt the whole thing. The Shadow, as they like to be called, want to capture Netero because they have a mysterious background with him. They succeed, because apparently Netero is getting soft in his old age, despite holding up his own with an infinitely more powerful creature from the Dark Continent after this point. So they take him to the roof for the next hour and 30 minutes whilst the rest of the cast try to figure out a way out of this. This ragtag group of bad guys is led by Zed, a man who had created a restriction of On. On is a darker, polar opposite to Nen. He developed it to kill Netero, because Netero, it turns out, hired him and his underlings to take care of the more dark and secretive roles that the Hunter Association needed to complete, off the record. Netero eventually found the source of their power, which is hate, by the way, too evil, and decided to kill them all for the sake of peace. But it turns out that hate lives on in a new incarnation of people, here once again, to have another pop at old man Netero. Gon and Killua instantly take care of one of them, and are disgusted when they discover that the restriction of On means death upon defeat. Gon especially is disgusted that Zed could treat his comrades like this. Kurapika, Hisoka, and Leo Ryo manage to defeat another one of the Shadow, whilst Zed freaks out on the roof. Apparently, he's keeping Netero alive right now to show him the destruction of the Hunter Association, and he just, he just instantly loses. It's it's <laughs> so stupid. There's no threat from the Shadow at all. So Gon and Killua quickly go to the roof to challenge Zed, but find that Nen is generally weaker than On, and that the only way to compete as equals is to make a restriction of On themselves. Gon makes the restriction, fights Zed, and distracts him long enough for Killua to sever the tie of On that was binding Netero. With Netero, Killua, and Gon all fighting, Zed is quickly annihilated. As they all stand on the roof, everyone's pretty <laughs> unfazed, to be honest. And that's kind of the biggest problem here. The film pretends to have high stakes at a point in the story where it can't possibly achieve it. First of all, a shadier group of people taking care of more morally ambiguous tasks sounds like a job for a group of heavily trained assassins or something. Maybe a group well known to Netero. Maybe the Zaldix. Literally the group that Netero is clearly already in alliance with and uses in the Chimera Antarch, making the Shadow completely irrelevant. 
Instead of making a film about the Shadow, they could have made it about Battle Olympia. Keep it simple, and put in a little more effort to what makes Hunter x Hunter so good, you know? Tactics and powers and how they use them. That is Hunter x Hunter's initial entertainment value. At least at surface level. And that's usually what anime movies are stuck with, because they can't advance the story in any other way, so they may as well excel at what they can. And that is, again, the surface layer of entertainment. With something like the Battle Olympia, you don't even need to make us care about the contestants, just have them go to town on each other with some original Nen powers, and that would have been amazing. The story of this film underlines the problem with anime cash grab films, that instead of really trying to even use the identity of their franchises, they nail the initial fanfare, and then they quickly devolve into cliches, making new characters that were there all along, and spend the next hour trying to explain and validate it. It's a big mistake, because no one cares. Just making something a little less ambitious would have solved this. The stakes of Kurapika staying blind not being able to seek further vengeance, or of the Hunter Association being destroyed, is just too much. Instead of even trying to write Nen, the second movie made a whole new power system. That is ridiculously ambitious. And again, a massive mistake. I'd give Phantom Rouge a 4 out of 10, and I'd give the last mission a 5 out of 10 with the only real difference being the potential of the last mission's beginning half being a little bit better than Phantom Rouge. But yeah, that's everything I have to say about the Hunter x Hunter movies. Early access patrons, let me thank you all from the bottom of my heart for your continued support. Comment your thoughts down below. Happy two-year hiatus, everyone, and I'll see you next time.